Good evening. Uh, welcome. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, the Education Specialist of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the 14th presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. This twice monthly webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Learning Guide in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Tonight's presentation is by Dr. Ann Davis. Dr. Davis is Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Pediatrics at Dartmouth Medical School, Hanover, New Hampshire. Her primary interests are in pediatric and adolescent gynecology, contraception, and preventative reproductive care. Her research has included many studies on contraception and menstrual irregularity. The title of her talk this evening is Puberty, an overview that highlights common misperceptions and challenges. I will now review the details of tonight's presentation. To make sure we can cover all the content in the allotted time, everyone's line except the speakers will be muted. We will devote time at the end of the presentation to questions. Please feel free to type a question in the chat window at any time. We will then read as many selected questions as possible to the presenter. If for some reason you need to step away from the presentation, please sign out and then sign back in upon your return. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your CME credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. Our speaker today is Dr. Ann Davis. We're very excited to have her, so I will now turn things over to Dr. Davis. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight to talk about this uh, uh, topic, uh, obviously to discuss all of puberty, normal, abnormal, uh, precocious, uh, delayed is impossible. Uh, fortunately, there have been many other of the Grand uh, Rounds uh, webinar series that has touched on uh, puberty, including the recent one by Dr. Lee and Dr. Pollack. So today, instead of uh, talking about laundry lists of etiologies, et cetera, uh, we will highlight some of the common uh, misperceptions and challenges. Instead of the laundry list, uh, I'm going to approach this in a slightly different way, and that is to have you kind of recall uh, the laundry list and reinforce these laundry lists in your uh, memory. My disclosures are listed here. Uh, and uh, they should not have any uh, direct impact on today's uh, discussion. Um, at the my objectives are listed here, and uh, I would like you to do something unusual, and that is to commit to a written answer. If uh, you have a group, you are welcome instead to have a discussion uh, regarding the answers, but it is very helpful uh, educational theory has shown that people who write down answers are more likely to remember the correct answer or reinforce their knowledge. So I'd like you to get a, a pencil and paper, uh, if you could, to do this. Uh, during this talk, we will apply knowledge of normal puberty and recognize abnormal. We'll list some common differential diagnoses for uh, both precocious puberty and for delayed puberty and delayed menarche. And then we'll talk about some of those challenges, if you will, and discuss the differential diagnosis of genital bleeding with both Tanner 1 and 2 breasts. And then finally, obviously, in one, one hour uh, presentation, it's impossible to really uh, review the various scientific and genetic uh, foundations of puberty. So at the end, I will go over some um, resources that you could use to do self-directed learning. Many years ago, I had the real pleasure of sitting down once with one of the true amazing people in our field, and that was Dr. Georgiana Jones, and discuss with her McCune Albright. I had had the good fortune to uh, spend uh, some time in London and go regularly to a McCune Albright uh, clinic at Great Ormond Street. And she was very interested in this disorder and said that she thought that this really had the foundational material if we understood it to understand puberty. I think she's right. It does give us a lot of that uh, foundation. But in modern day, I think it's actually if we have an understanding of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and the constitutional delay patients that really will help us understand the scientific and genetic principles of, uh, of puberty 
and so I will share some of those resources at the end. All right, I'd like everyone to get that pencil and paper, and I'd like you to answer the two following questions, and I'll give you about a minute to do that. Please really do write them on paper. That helps you uh, uh, retain them long term and reinforce uh, any additional information. All right, so let's answer those questions. What is the definition of delayed puberty? Lack, and of course we are talking about females today, so lack of breast development by age 13. We know that 95% of females in the U.S. have reached Tanner stage 2 in the, uh, by the 12th year of life and uh, by the end of the 12th year, so 13 is what has become the definition. Now note that there are differences between the differential diagnosis of, of course, delayed puberty, lack of breast development, and delayed menarche, but some of these diagnoses will present with both. The only reason I uh, mention this is fairly obvious to uh, reproductive endocrine uh, uh, fellows is that this is a confusing point for early learners as you become uh, educators. Now, given this definition, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to relook at your uh, top three uh, diagnoses uh, that are common in a patient with delayed puberty and see if you want to make any modifications on that list using this definition, lack of breast development by age 13, the commonly accepted definition. All right. So here are the three most common diagnoses in patients with uh, delayed puberty. First of all are hypergonadotropic hypogonadism patients. So of course the classic example and most common of this is the Turner syndrome. If you look at series that are in the literature, the ones done in the 70s and 80s, this will be the most common diagnosis. However, in recent series, we see less of this diagnosis. Why? Well, the reason is because many of our young women with Turner syndrome are not going to present to us with pubertal occurrences. Instead, they will have already been diagnosed, many of them actually in utero, due to uh, changes on ultrasound and also small for gestational age. So whether this is the most common depends on which series you look at and when it was done, but certainly this is one of the more common diagnoses uh, in patients with uh, delayed puberty. Of course, many of the patients will also present with primary ovarian insufficiency and are XY gonadodysgenesis patients. Another common diagnosis is constitutional delay. I hate the term. Uh, these are sometimes referred to in the literature as our late bloomers. Um, that is a rather derogatory term and one that uh, certainly would not be something that we would want to communicate to a, a young teen. But it is true that these patients are just uh, maturing but at approximately uh, more than two and a half standard deviations from what would be expected uh, from normative data. And then the third one on this list that is in our three type diagnosis are our patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. These are our patients with both Kalman syndrome that are either anosmic or are hyponosmic 
or our patients with so-called NIHH, that's the normal uh, filmic uh, uh, patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. In other words, they have no defect in their smell. Now, one of the interesting things about Kalman syndrome, which by definition is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with aberrant in their ability to smell, is that many of the patients don't even recognize this, especially the ones that uh, are not completely anosmic. Although we have also seen patients who have Kalman syndrome and don't aren't able to smell, but don't recognize it. Now. The fourth diagnosis that is less common, but in any series in the literature, you will see a smattering of all types of severe systemic diseases. These may include autoimmune diseases. They may be, include cardiac uh, defects with um, uh, severe uh, uh, problems, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the uh, diseases and one of the challenges that I want to talk about that are easy uh, to miss unless we are really good diagnosticians. And of course, less commonly also, the CNS lesions, uh, particularly uh, uh, cranial uh, pharyngiomas. So this is one of the challenges that we have. When we see delayed puberty in females, I think we go to those three top diagnoses but forget about these unusual uh, systemic uh, diseases. Uh, so it's really important in these patients to really do a complete review of systems, every body system, and a really complete physical uh, with lots of attention to reviewing their growth charts, asking them good review of question, uh, system questions, infections, headaches, joint pains, uh, pork perfusion, looking carefully at their nail beds, et cetera, et cetera. And I think all of us have seen uh, patients with these uh, disorders. I know I had one a patient with, presented with this with renal failure. So it's really important um, to do a good, good history and physical. You should also draw prolactin. This would be an unusual presentation of a patient uh, with a prolactinoma, but they have been reported. Of course, most patients will have had estrogen on board, so will have had breast development uh, before uh, a prolactinoma will present. Now, another challenge in delayed puberty patients, and a really tough one, is distinguishing constitutional delay. Those patients that just are presenting uh, two and a half uh, standard deviations from the norm with the so-called idiopathic hypogonadism uh, gonadism patients. And I have that I in quotes because, of course, with time we are finding more and more of the genetic uh, reasons that we can explain why they are hypogonadotropic, hypogonadism patients. Um, but the uh, label of idiopathic has remained. So what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is the anosmic uh, testing, and your pediatric endocrine department can help you with this if you do not have those in your uh, office, which most of us do not. You also can pay close attention to growth charts and age, but in reality, uh, this is very, very difficult if that anosmic testing is uh, negative. Certainly, by age 17 or 18, we will know the patients will declare themselves, but patients and families hate to hear this. Doing various stimulation tests, et cetera, has not proven to be that uh, fruitful. Some people will give some, uh, do some serial uh, ovarian ultrasound, and as you start to see some follicular, early follicular activity, this will assure the family. But this is a tough, tough problem and one that is tough to communicate with families that there is no really good way to make this distinction. Finally, Maybe this distinction doesn't even exist, or at least in some situations does not exist. One of the most fascinating things about uh, constitutional delay uh, versus our so-called idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is that they have oftentimes have similar mutations. And in fact, they may be the same spectrum, may be on the same spectrum of disorders. So this really is an arena which may give us 
uh, greater visions into what really starts and stops the pubertal process. All right, delayed menarche. Uh, last uh, recently, Dr. Pollack talked uh, about uh, this, uh, and uh, we'll just touch on this uh, briefly. Which of the following patients who has not had onset of their first menstrual period deserves evaluation? You can go ahead and read those yourself, and then please, I'll give you about 30 seconds to commit to an answer. Which one of these patients uh, uh, who has not um, uh, had patient or patients, you may have more than one answer, who has not had an onset of their first menstrual period deserves evaluation. Again, you may have more than one answer. And the answer is that every single one of these patients deserves evaluation. Uh, this is a document that was jointly produced between American Academy of Pediatric and American College of OBGYN, uh, I think about 2009, and then was revisited and republished in 2015. And they said that each and every one of these patients deserves evaluation. If they haven't started uh, a menarche within three years of thelarche. And this brings up an important uh, point and challenge in uh, reproductive endocrine and pubertal problems, and that is the uh, assessment and documentation of uh, thelarche. Uh, with electronic records now, oftentimes one sees uh, check marks or uh, in an electronic record rather than notation that the uh, young woman has progressed from uh, Tanner 1 to Tanner 2. So sometimes it is difficult to even get a documentation of when thelarche uh, occurred even in patients who are receiving great uh, preventive care. Uh, in patients who have uh, not started by 14 years of age in hirsutism to try to look at the uh, diagnosis, making the diagnosis and intervening of PCOS earlier. And then patients who by age 14 have a history or exam suggesting of excessive eating, uh, excessive exercise or an eating disorder. And then finally, uh, given two standard deviations uh, uh, from uh, two and a half from normal uh, would occur in uh, around 15 years of age, so if they haven't started by then. I want to highlight the one uh, about uh, uh, signs and symptoms of an eating disorder. Um, and the reason is because of the mortality associated with this, and this again is one of those missteps or challenges that we oftentimes forget. Uh, as we're dealing with patients with uh, delayed menarche. And the uh, mortality of anorexia over about a 10-year interval is about 5%, and those are for the uh, patients who are in uh, therapy. Most patients with anorexia will present with secondary amenorrhea, some with primary amenorrhea, and it's quite rare, but occasionally there are reports that patients will present with delayed puberty and lack of breast development. So I want you to commit to a written answer about the two following, since this is a challenge and uh, missteps can obviously be associated with uh, mortality. Uh, what questions do you ask when screening for eating disorders? And then I want you to list findings on physical exam that would be suggestive of anorexia other than a low body mass. Index. So if you'll commit to some written answers on those two questions, I'll give you about 45 seconds.
in answering the first question, there are many questions that you could use, and there are various screening tools that have been validated uh, in screening for uh, disordered eating and eating disorders. Um, these are the ones that I use, and I've listed here the uh, sensitivity and specificity for them. But they're very helpful as a general screen. And generally, I just weave them into the history, not all at once, but uh, randomly so that they're not all four in a row. But how many diets have you been on over the last year? Do you feel you should be dieting? Are you satisfied with your body size? And weight, weight affects the way that you feel about yourself. And these are four good questions to ask that really do have some great sensitivity and specificity and a good correlation factor. But there are many others. And you may want to adopt uh, the screening questions that are used by your, uh, if you're in a major medical center, your team. But these general questions I find very, very helpful. What about the physical exam? Well, I think one of the things that we oftentimes miss in the physical examination of young women, as I said, it's so important to do a complete history and physical, uh, not just the GYN history and physical are vital signs. Many of these patients with uh, anorexia will present with uh, a marked bradycardia and also uh, low blood pressure. So it's very important to, uh, uh, to look at these. And in fact, and they are a good marker of the rare patient, and it is rare, who is going to require emergency uh, admission uh, given the fact that she is uh, that unstable. Another attentive uh, thing to look for on physical exam are signs of forced emesis. So this includes uh, knuckles that are raised, um, uh, chipped teeth uh, from uh, young women using oftentimes spoons or other objects to uh, induce emesis. And then enlargement of the parotid glands is not uncommon at all. Many uh, patients uh, with uh, severe disordered eating and anorexia will eat large amounts of carrots and cantaloupe, so you may find keratinemia on their palms and soles. I will never forget the time one of the pediatric surgeons called me into the uh, operating room to look at a young woman's ovaries, which were quite uh, orange, and uh, I said, so she hasn't had a period. No one in the room could tell me whether she's had not had a period recently, but as it turned out after she woke up, she indeed had not had a period in quite some time. So keratinemia, of course, we're going to see it on the palms uh, and uh, soles, but uh, that is uh, another marker that would be important not to miss. Lanugo, very common. And then one that I think gets missed is perianal erythema. Um, a substantial percentage, and probably in the 10 to 20 percent of young women, will use laxatives uh, to try to decrease their caloric intake with uh, some of the disordered eating. And whenever you see marked perianal erythema, uh, you should uh, think about that possibility. I've seen that in, uh, particularly in the patients that seem to have uh, bulimia as part of their disordered eating. Uh, interestingly, by the way, it is very ineffective in reducing caloric intake. All right, let's do another case here. June is a 15-year-old female with 10 or 5 breast development and no menses. What is your differential uh, diagnosis? And again, I'm going to ask you to commit to a written answer. All right, this one uh, you've talked about recently as part of the Grand Round series. Uh, certainly the list of possibilities is below vaginal agenesis, androgen insensitivity, PCOS, DOI, malnutrition, including anorexia as mentioned, uh, CNS lesions and tumors, including prolactinomas, uh, and then uh, systemic illnesses and endocrine disorders. So those are going to be the most common. Um, it's interesting also in your role of educator, if you ask uh, students uh, about this and some of the um, 
of PG1, you may also hear imperfect hymen, but it is really rare for this to present this late because if you think about it with the average age of menarche being much earlier uh, in the 12th year of life, uh, it would have presented uh, before then. And remember, most uh, menses begin when young women are in TAN or 4 staging. So uh, it would be rare for an imperfect hymen to present this late uh, at age 15, but of course it can occur. All right, let's change and now talk about precocious development. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, a question here which I'm not going to give you time to uh, answer because we're going to look at Normandy's data first. We have a seven-year-old Afro-American girl who's brought in by her mother because she says she's already on the way to requiring a bra. On exam, you note that she has tan or two breast and pubic hair. And by the way, um, asking for bras is not uncommon in young children, and of course this has to do with uh, many times the representation of bras and breasts that they may see on television programs, et cetera. Um, but uh, uh, you would say, gosh, tan or two, no one's going to ask for a bra, but uh, believe me, this does happen. So what would you recommend to do for Sarah in evaluating this tan or two breast and pubic hair? And I've listed here some of the possibilities, CNS imaging, history and physical, telling her that it's normal, um, uh, estradiol level, and gonadotropin. But before we really ask you to commit for a answer, let's look at some of the normative data and review that. So of course, um, for many, many years, the normatives regarding puberty were from uh, British war orphans uh, who were malnourished and ethnically not diverse, uh, and then this study was published uh, in 1997, uh, and it was a office practice study of a large a number of young women uh, who had been assessed for a secondary sexual characteristics. The problem with this study uh, that has received a lot of criticism is that there was not palpation done on the breast tissue. Um, it is really difficult to tell tan or two and even tan or three uh, breast development from chubby chest unless you don't palpate. So this has been one of the criticisms of this study. However, it is the much better than malnourished, uh, ethnically non-diverse uh, uh, British uh, war uh, orphans. Now, if we look at this, first at looking at pubic hair, uh, we can see at age seven, as the blue arrow, that uh, almost 18% of Afro-American uh, girls are going to have a, a tanner stage a pu a two pubic hair, and of our uh, white girls, about 3%. Now, immediately people say, well, you said ethnically diverse, where are Hispanic girls? And unfortunately, there were Hispanic uh, girls in both the white and the Afro-American groups, so we cannot make any conclusions regarding them, although there is some data that they tend to run uh, more uh, along the data with the uh, white girls uh, from, um, from other studies. What about breast development, 10 or 2 or greater? Uh, about 15% of the Afro-American girls had Tanner stage 2 breasts, again by observation, not by palpation, and uh, about 5% of the white girls. This study found the fo following, that adrenarche preceded thelarche in the majority of Afro-American girls and about 15% of our Caucasian girls. Uh, the mean age of thelarche in our Afro-American girls was about 8.9 uh, years of age, where at, it was 9.9 .9 years in our white girls. Uh, mean age of menarche was not as markedly different, only about a half a year uh, different. And as I already mentioned, of course, most gals are uh, tan or four at menarche. And the mean interval between the time of thelarche and menses was, was two years, but the earlier thelarche was, the longer this uh, became. But as we've noted earlier, uh, we file outside the normative if it's more than uh, three years between thelarche and menarche. So 
So who should we evaluate for precocious puberty? This is a big, big uh, controversy because the Pediatric Endocrine Society published an article saying that we should uh, evaluate white girls with breast or pubic hair prior to age seven or Afro-American girls with either breast or pubic hair that appeared prior to age six. But the problem is that in 2003, uh, a study was done showing that if you use these as the normatives, you are going to miss uh, some serious pathology uh, in about 15% of the uh, population. And uh, they preferred instead of just saying if you have any young woman with either breast or pubic hair uh, prior to age uh, eight, you should consider uh, doing an evaluation. And by serious pathology, we mean CNS lesions, DAH, granulosa cell tumors, McEwen and Albright. So these were not uh, minor matters. So back to the question, knowing this and reviewing this normative data, what would you do for uh, our patient Sarah? And again, you may have uh, more than one answer. I'll give you about uh, 20 seconds to uh, make a decision. Well, there's no right or wrong answer to some of these, but certainly I think the red ones are, are uh, reasonable, especially B and C. Doing a complete history and physical exam, asking about any signs of anything that could be CNS, uh, any headaches, any changes in behavior, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, reassurance that this is likely normal. Should you do CNS imaging? Well, it depends. No one's going to say that that would be wrong because missing a CNS lesion would uh, be uh, catastrophic in many cases. But uh, given the fact that we saw by normative data that this was pr uh, pretty common in an Afro-American uh, young woman, many people would say that it is not worth it or to discuss it with the family. So that's why I have that pink. I would also, and again, you could argue this one, do an estradiol level. And the reason is it is so difficult to pick up a, a, a granulosa cell tumor of the uh, ovary. You might say, well, why not go ahead and just get an ultrasound? That's going to be a lot less cost effective. And I will promise you that the estradiol will be very high. You get back an estradiol level in the three and four hundreds, and you know that you have an estrogen producing tumor and you get one in normal levels and you uh, normal for this age group uh, and you know that uh, you don't. So right and wrong answers, no, but certainly B and C are absolute. No one would fault you with doing imaging, but generally most people would just do a very good history and physical. And I think the uh, E2 level is reasonable uh, also. Let's take another case. And I will have you commit to a, um, an answer again. Ella is a seven-year-old Caucasian girl who presents with genital bleeding. Her exam shows no normal vital signs and a normal growth chart. Exam includes Tanner 1 pubic hair and Tanner 1 breast. Uh, you feel comfortable that this bleeding is genital, genital and of course that is uh, uh, difficult sometimes to ascertain. Uh, which of the following is most likely the diagnosis for her genital bleeding? Commit to a written answer. Well, the most likely diagnosis is the one in red, urethral prolapse. McCune-Albright is also possible, and we're going to talk about McCune-Albright syndrome. It's a fascinating syndrome, and it is also possible. The vast majority will have breast development before bleeding, but not all of them. I shouldn't say the vast majority. Many will have uh, uh, the 
development of breast before they actually bleed, but an occasional one will produce such a burst of, of estrogen and get a, a, an abrupt stimulation and withdrawal that they will bleed before actually having uh, breast development. So that's not a wrong answer, but it is by far the most likely is urethral prolapse. Granulosa cell tumors of the ovaries, they're going to produce uh, enough estrogen that she is definitely going to have a breast bud, if not a tan or three. And then, although it's written over and over again in the literature, there is no documentation that accidental uh, use of mother's birth control pills on a sequential basis is, is likely uh, and uh, a cause of various uh, bleeding problems in children, although Certainly, uh, ingestion of a large amount of them uh, giving a bolus of estrogen uh, could cause a bleed. This is extremely poorly documented and probably does not occur uh, very often at all. So here's a young woman with urethral prolapse. Um, you can uh, see there the donut uh, object um, um, that, sorry. I'm going to point that out, sorry. Um, I hit the wrong button here. Here is a donut-shaped uh, object. This is a beautiful uh, a crescent-shaped prepubertal hymen, white spin, uh, in characteristic. And above that, you see the urethra that has turned inside out. And these present almost always of bleeding. 90% of the time, these will present with bleeding. Seldom, do they, interestingly, do they present with urinary symptomatology. So this is one of the challenges um, that, uh, again, can result in missteps. And it seems obvious uh, in retrospect. But if you don't have breasts, the etiology is probably not estrogen related. And as I have already discussed, rarely or some of the time, the Kuhn Albright is a, uh, an exception to that. So when you don't have breast development, of course you want to say, is it really genital bleeding? Of course, it may be urinary or rectal. But if it does seem to be genital bleeding, the most common etiologies are going to be such things as foreign objects in the vagina, urethral prolapse, trauma, uh, rarely labeled labial adhesions, which I'll discuss with the next slide. And of course, sexual abuse should always be uh, considered. Although, um, uh, if you see transsections uh, uh, in the hymen, this should be high on your uh, differential. Interestingly and sadly, uh, uh, most sexual abuse is, uh, if not caused lacerations, but it is still, of course, nonetheless of something we don't want to miss, uh, but bleeding is not uh, one of the common presentations in practices. In an emergency room setting, that does change a little. I mentioned labial adhesion, so here you see the telltale uh, midline uh, line here. And rarely they will present with bleeding because edges of that adhesion come undone and the patient will have bleeding. But again, if you don't have uh, breast development and you have genital bleeding, it rarely is uh, endocrine in etiology. So I'd like you to list what would be the top two etiologies of precocious uh, puberty. I'll give you about uh, 20 seconds to do that. What are the top two things that are associated with precocious PVD in terms of etiology? Well, around 75% are idiopathic, and of course, this is a desuppression, as I'll talk about on the uh, slide, that's just occurring earlier than we see in the normal uh, pubertal process. Uh, the rest of the patients with complete uh, precocious puberty, that is gonadotropin-dependent uh, precocious puberty, will have some type of central cause. And these are going to be CNS tumors, uh, vascular malformation, um, 
granulomas can cause this, and, and uh, patients uh, in countries with high incidences of uh, tuberculosis, this is reported more frequently as a cause. Um, so anything in the CNS that activates uh, the actin. Very rare, but something that's always asked about, uh, especially on uh, boards, <coughs> is primary uh, severe hypothyroidism can also probably from cross-reaction of CSH and FSH. Now, we said that these are idiopathic, and you see that little red star, and that is, again, one of our challenges in uh, puberty. Uh, and we know that uh, likely these aren't really idiopathic and that uh, genetic research will probably reveal a lot more etiology. We know uh, already that we have found that activation of Kisspeptin gene and receptors have been found and probably with time more and more of these will be explained. Kind of the same syndrome that we saw with uh, the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Um, and, uh, Again, another fascinating uh, subject. So most cases of complete uh, or central precocious puberty, of course, these are going to be uh, GNRH uh, 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 dependent, are just uh, early activation of the arcuate nucleus or the desuppression. Um, and as we said, would suspect, after desuppression, our LH levels will be higher than our FSH. And uh, in older literature, this is sometimes referred to as uh, true precocious puberty because these patients well develop cyclic menses, and of course, they can ovulate. Uh, and in these patients, of course, the pregnancies have been reported in uh, very, very young girls in the five to six year old range. It's important to remember with this process. Um, is that behavioral issues are not uncommon. Uh, these young women are subjected to more sexual abuse. They also oftentimes feel that they don't fit in with their peers and have other psychosocial and uh, uh, developmental difficulties. So not only does this cause problem in terms of uh, height, attention, uh, uh, attainment, but also many psychosocial problems. They will, of course, uh, generally uh, respond to a GNRH agonist, but I will tell you that it takes a lot more uh, to get them uh, uh, downregulated uh, than it does patients that you are using uh, agonists with, and that you also have to check these patients regularly because they will escape uh, their agonist and may require uh, an enlarger dose. Again, most are idiopathic, it's just uh, early activation, but it is very critical and one of the challenges to be sure that every one of these patients has had exclusion of a CNS tumor or mass or lesion. Now, those are the gonad, so we've just discussed the uh, gonadotropin uh, dependent, but what about the non-central or the gonadotropin independent causes of precocious puberty? which make up only a small percentage of the cases, lists the two most common etiologies of non-central or so-called gonadotropin-independent precocious puberty. And I'll give you about 20 seconds to do that. All right, to answer McCune Albright syndrome, um, the triad is listed here the Cafe LA spot, kind of the post domain look, the uh, polyostic fibrous dysplasia of bones, uh, may we have a history of, uh, of, of um, fractures, and then of course GNR independent precocity. And of course, not all patients will present with all of those, and there's, uh, you may only have a tip of the iceberg. Uh, we know uh, that these are somatic cell uh, mutations of G protein, uh, and we know that the reason that they get bleeding is autonomous estrogen production from a uh, follicular cyst. They typically will go through the pubertal process, and again, fascinating uh, disease. 
because they will, after they go through it, become gonadotropin dependent. Uh, it would take an entire uh, presentation to talk about how to try to treat these patients, but uh, basically there is no easy treatment for these patients. Um, uh, things like aromatase inhibitors uh, may work in terms of some of the bleeding for a short time, but oftentimes do not work long term. In fact, typically do not. So that is one of the uh, uh, one of the etiologies. The second uh, one of the top two are the ovarian estrogen producing tumors, and the most common would be the granulosa cell tumor. Although, of course, other steroid producing tumors uh, do exist. Um, a rare cause is a isolated estrogen uh, producing cyst. Uh, these typically present with just breast development but may go on uh, to have more than that. But one wonders if these aren't, uh, again, part of the spectrum really of McEwen-Albright if they go on. But a careful history and physical is important, but remember that these cases only these etiologies only involve less than 5% of cases of precocious puberty. So this is a nice little um, uh, summary of causes of uh, central and uh, GnRH-independent uh, precocious puberty. And of course, there are uh, also some of these uh, coincidental, uh, usually um, genetic uh, problems. Um, that have been diagnosed long before that are also associated with uh, a precocity. And these include things like um, uh, uh, deletions of 9P and things like uh, abnormalities of the 14th uh, uh, chromosome, so-called temple syndrome, et cetera. But these don't present to us because they're known to have this association. So in summary, I hope that I've, uh, these are oftentimes uh, presentations that end up being laundry lists, but I hope I've tried to uh, highlight some of the uh, missteps that are easy to, uh, to make and uh, some of the controversies and difficulties in uh, pubertal aberrancy. I think it's also important to realize that you, uh, especially as you prepare for boards, need to get an understanding of some of the uh, scientific and uh, genetic foundations of puberty. Uh, Endotex.com has a uh, synopsis uh, of puberty, and at the end of it is a, are a large number of references that I think uh, are very uh, important and um, could help you on your own self-directed learning plan uh, on these uh, uh, disorders. And again, as I mentioned, I pay particular attention to uh, the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and constitutional delay, as these merely may uh, show us uh, uh, what really is going on on the initiation of puberty. And the second article that I uh, listed here is a good one on kiss pepsin. Certainly, we know uh, that this is an important part uh, of initiation of the pubertal process, and there are many up and downstream uh, regulators. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to, uh, uh, to try to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, we'll give everyone a, a moment here. If someone has a question, please uh, go ahead and type that in the chat window. We'll, we'll wait a moment, a uh, minute or so here in case someone has to uh, spend some time uh, typing out their questions. Well, it appears no one has a question, so I'll go ahead and move to uh, our closing comments. Uh, thank you for attending tonight's webinar with Dr. Ann Davis. Make sure you return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey to receive your CME credit. Also, uh, as with all of our Grand Round series, uh, this uh, we do post them uh, about a week after these initial live presentations. So if you want to come back and review this at any time, of course, you can. It's free uh, through the ASRM uh, eLearn uh, uh, website and registration. Our next live webinar will be on Wednesday, April the 6th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern with Dr. Randall Odom, who will present on the topic of female infertility. So look for an email from ASRM with registration details about that uh, soon. Uh, my thanks again uh, to our speaker this evening. Uh, my thanks to everyone in attendance. This webinar is now ended.